Hi people, I hope you're all well. Uh, so this is a video I had intended to make around this time. Um, it's now 101 days uh, since Rishi Sunak became the 57th Prime Minister. Uh, but I'm going to round it off to 100 days. It's just a good milestone. Um, you know, usually that would be fairly uneventful for Prime Ministers because unlike presidencies where there's a fixed time period, Prime Ministers have all sorts of tenures going from the, the very brief period of Liz Truss to the very extensive period of Sir Robert Walpole, um, you know, so there's just huge variation there. That's why the 100 days mark has not usually got the same resonance with a Prime Minister as it would with a President. But given the, the way British politics is right now, um, given the amount of uncertainty, Rishi Sunak himself may only be Prime Minister for two years if uh, Starmer wins the next uh, election, which is quite plausible the way Labour is doing in the polls right now. Uh, actually, I got uh, this on eBay a few days ago um, from Spectator. Is Rishi ready? I like the cover art. It shows like the portraits of Tory Prime Ministers Cameron, May, Johnson and Truss gradually getting smaller. Um, that's only partially, I think, a reference to the tenure in office. It's uh, just showing... That, you know what's interesting, though? The picture makes Sunak look grumpy, but you have to look a little bit closer. Um, it's not really. He's just got a strange expression on his face. But, yeah, uh, good cover art. I used to get the Week magazine, but that seems very hard to find on eBay at the moment, uh, at least more so than it used to be. Um... So what I want to do in this video is just have a little analysis of how I feel about Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. Uh, the man, his ideology, his his delivery and so on. Um, this is only going to be scratching the surface because, yeah, um, firstly it's been a relatively brief period, a little longer than Liz Truss. Um, in less than 20 days he will surpass uh, George Canning which again is not nothing to shout about because until Liz Trust George Canning was the shortest serving Prime Minister. He uh, he was in office for a few months in 1827. Hmm. Excuse me. I have a slight uh, pain in my mouth. Uh, anyway. So uh, I'm not really doing this in any particular order or anything like that. I'm not going to give a bi big biography of his political life. I'll start with one thing though. Um, which is one of the first things people think of when they think of Rishi Sunak, uh, his wealth. He is very, very wealthy, um, probably the wealthiest prime minister we've ever had. Although I think adjusted for inflation, some of those 18th century prime ministers must have been quite well off as they tended to be. Nevertheless, at least in modern times, uh, he is a very wealthy man. Uh, the Sunaks have a fortune close to a billion. Um, I don't know what the precise figure is, but it's certainly a lot of money. Um, and, and the reality is that's something that most people just can't resonate with. Um, even other prime ministers who became millionaires after Downing Street from speaking tours and so on, uh, Tony Blair, Theresa May, that, that's dwarfed by the wealth of Rishi Sunak. But it is what it is. Um, and I, I'm of the opinion that we should judge the man on his policies and his record, not his bank account. Now, I understand the argument here. If, um, if Rishi Sunak doesn't have to worry about, you know, money and he doesn't have to worry about uh, rising living costs personally, how can he, how can he empathise, how can he relate to the public? And that's a, that's a valid argument, but I don't necessarily think politicians have to be in the shoes of the people that they're representing in order to, to enact good policies. I mean, that would be quite utopian and unrealistic, because then you would have a situation where, for example, a prime minister could only, uh, or any politician could only have productive crime policies if they've personally been burgled. Well, that's it's not really realistic. Or let's say they could only have um, funding for cancer treatment or provide funding for cancer treatment if they've had cancer. So I, I don't necessarily agree with this idea that uh, you have to just have an exact replica of what the public is going through in order to enact good policies. What they do have to do, 
what Sunak has to do is listen, listen to people's concerns and not just listen, act on them. That is the key thing. It's not about, you know, so the fact that he's extremely wealthy doesn't mean he has, he's devoid of a social compass. And I don't actually believe he is. I think it's all too easy to put Sunak in this bracket of a rich kid uh, who doesn't get it. I'm not sure if that's entirely fair. I think sometimes his PR isn't the best. You know, when he turns up at sort of building sites and so on wearing Prada shoes. Ultimately, I don't think politicians should be judging what they wear, but it's not really the best PR. Um, so perhaps he could be a little bit more assertive in that regard, uh, because all that does is lend into the caricature that he's a rich guy. Um, but like I say, I really don't think that should be the priority. I don't think people should be judging Rishi Sunak on what he wears or his bank account. What they should be judging him on is his policies and his record. That's what really matters. I mean, remember John F. Kennedy was extremely wealthy or came from a very wealthy family, um, yet he's often remembered for his um, conscientious social policies. So I don't think it necessarily follows that a wealthy politician can't be conscientious. Um now, with Sunak, there was that whole prolonged Tory leadership race. Like I call it the Sunak Trust Show. I think it was too prolonged, and I think they made the wrong decision. I personally felt, even as a non-Tory member, they should have went with Sunak back in October, uh, September, actually. Um, but they went with Trust. It was a big mistake. This Trust and quasi quartering that budget was just a disaster. Why? Because it pandered to the rich at a time of like, rising living costs. And um, this is something the Tories need to be very, very wary of. Um, you know, they can say it's class war. They could say it's a lazy caricature. Uh, but when people are struggling, they will, that sort of thing resonates because they will look at it and say, who are the Tories really serving? Um, so Sunak needs to be acutely aware of that. Um, now, I'm not going to get in depth into economics because it's uh, something admittedly I uh, I need to verse myself a lot more on so I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to analyze that in detail but I do think Sunak needs to be aware of that and um, you know in some ways I, I feel there was a slight um, sort of bittersweet with his victory in October in the sense yes he made it to Downing Street which is something only a very, very small number of politicians manage to do. On the other hand, there was sort of a sense that he, his his coronation was blown by trust getting it earlier in the year. On the other hand, uh, Sunakites might say, well, he was vindicated. He warned the trust's economic policies would lead to that, and they did. But then again, they're both Tories. And this is one of the biggest problems the Tories face at the moment, is this internal situation. Now, Labour would be incredibly foolish to wage civil war at a time when the Tories are doing the same thing. What Labour should be doing is uniting themselves. So the hard left, you know, if they're calling Starmer Tory lights or they're trying to bring him down, they're just being fools because what that will do is guarantee the Tories will stay in power. Just getting another drink. <clears throat> You know, the moment, um, in a way, politics seems kind of conventional again, but you have quite clearly defined left and right. And that's that's a good thing. I mean, Starmer is often labelled a centrist, but I think he is more on the left. I don't think he's a Blairite. I, I don't think he is Tony Blair Mark II. And uh, as much as I think Blair was a great statesman, I understand why that needs to be the case. Be a bit more on the left. Uh, but then again... This country, uh, I think, is not fundamentally a very left-wing country. We're not a very conservative country either. But no, the public will never vote into office a hard left leader. So Starmer has to do things like, uh, for example, show that Labour is tough on crime. And I think the big Achilles heel that Labour has is getting away from wokeism. Now, the only reason I'm mentioning Labour is it, it, it configures into what Rishi Sunak, as Prime Minister, needs to be aware of going up against. Uh, I think there is a risk that for unelected prime ministers in the sense that they're appointed into office, they could be a bit complacent and think, well, I've made it to the top. 
Um, and that's it. I can't get any higher now, so it doesn't really matter if Labour win. Um, I'm not saying that's Sunak's thinking, but I think there is a tendency or a potential the Prime Minister's can have, I mean, even though they would be blamed for an election defeat, in a purely selfish outlook, and I'm not saying this is the way they're thinking, but it's just something to think about. Well, they made it to the top and that's it. And their party, well, if their party loses, that's that. But they made it to the top. Um, because there's been a lot of debate over this idea of uh, prime ministers being appointed rather than elected or uh, internally elected, rather, from their own party because it represents less than, probably less than a percent of the entire country, which is fundamentally not really democratic. But we're not a presidential system and the democracy lies in voting for the party not the Prime Minister. That's something that needs to be reiterated. And the Tories will point to the fact Gordon Brown got into office that way. But maybe maybe there is some need to reform this because I think it does create a detached situation from the public. Um, but anyway, when I said it, it's a bit like traditional left and right, one obvious thing around that is the strikes, public sector strikes, nurses, railway workers, apparently firefighters now, ambulance workers, um, it feels like the old left-right battles of the 80s and even 70s. Um, the government has to be careful not to be seen to be vilifying the strikers because a lot of the public are sympathetic to them. But I think it does vary on the profession. I think nurses, for example, have a very large amount of support. I think the 19% they're asking for is unrealistic, but I think 10% given what they went through during the pandemic, given that they were absolutely on the front line of that. Um, but the government has to be careful not to be seen to be kind of bullying them or, um, you know, putting out false propaganda. For example, it's true that the average nurse is on 34,000, which is, is an okay salary, but actually for a lot of nurses, it's less than that. And when you factor in childcare, traveling to work, bills, there's a lot of things to consider. So, what may seem like an okay salary on the surface, when you factor in other things, it's it's a real struggle. And no MP has a right to lecture, um, you know, nurses. MPs get 84,000. Now, I personally don't think, actually, I think, you know, being an elected politician is a very pressurising job. They're under constant scrutiny. Uh, it's not an easy job. So I don't actually think that they're necessarily paid too much. Maybe a drop. 10,000 off that. But I've no problem with MPs getting a comfortable salary. I think it is a very difficult job. But nurses should clearly get more. Um, of course, everyone who's striking, I, I realistically, probably not everyone's going to get raised. And I think that the public, again, the sympathies vary from profession to profession. I think there's less sympathy with railway workers because people think, well, we have the situation where often railway companies are not good value for money. They're overpriced. Um, trains are not reliable. Uh, and yet they're asking for more money. But I think, again, we have to be a little bit careful not to sort of interpret that as, for example, it's not all train drivers on 50,000, which, by the way, anyone who says they can't live on 50,000 has a problem. I think probably some of those workers will be on a lot less. So, again... The small details matter before people jump to conclusions. Um, but yeah, I think what the government's proposing, for example, for instance, that there is a minimum threshold for the strike, that is to say, um, um, uh, I think the lower level, 40%, uh, if I'm getting this right, uh, if if there's less than 40% support for strike action, it shouldn't go ahead, or there should be a certain... Uh, quota or a certain proportion that is still, I'm not describing this well, but basically what the government is saying is we need a situation where the public is not adversely affected by this. Um, and they're still, you know, especially for emergency services, they can still get the help that they need. And I think probably nurses and firefighters and some would agree with that. Um, you know, nurses and other emergency services, I don't think they're fundamentally in the business of striking. That's why it's a relatively rare occurrence. So that shows how bad things have got. 
that they feel they've no other choice but to strike. I support the right to strike. I think it's a fundamental um, human right. But I'm against wildcat strikes, and I do think some of these unions are motivated by class war. I do think some of them don't care about the stress that it causes the public. And that's something people need to be aware of. I mean, strikers need to be aware of. This is having an effect on the public. But, you know, it's... I don't entirely trust union bosses either. Having said that, you know, the rights are very good at attacking those union leaders, and maybe some of them deserve that, if they themselves are on very high salaries and, you know, they take pleasure from causing public disruption. On the other hand, um, I think it's criminal and totally rotten how some of these... Um, managers of private rail companies are making more than the Prime Minister in salary. I think that's outrageous. Uh, I think the energy companies are also greedy. So I totally support some sort of windfall tax against those people. They're simply overpaid. There's no um, there's no justification what for whatsoever for any sort of bonuses or pay increases for them at this time. Not when there's rising and living costs for the public. Not when the public are not seeing... Um, value for money you know there's no justification for them really to be on the salaries they are and i think as a matter of goodwill they should voluntarily cut their salaries um and if it's independently you know assessed then they could donate to charity or something but they have to be aware i mean especially the energy companies they can say it's as a result of the ukraine war but i i think fundamentally they're greedy the same with the you know, the CEOs of Tesco or the big sh supermarkets, you know, um, it's just this stingy little increase. It's like, uh, for example, um, cheap bread, 69 pence one week and 79 pence the next week. Is there really justification for that? I'm not sure that there is. Um, just, I just think, I think greed is fundamentally at play in some of this. Um but back to Rishi Sunak, I mean, I'm not speaking that much about the man because it has only been 100 days. Like every new prime minister, he has his own little pet projects that he wants to push through. I remember, for example, he was talking about finding people who miss GP appointments. Thankfully, that seems to have been ditched. It was a silly idea. Why? Because it wasn't realistic. Um, it was this kind of, this is one thing the Tories often do. It's this arbitrary collective punishment. Um that this is fine, everyone, without looking at individual circumstances. It may well be that someone has tried to get through to the GP, but the phone keeps being engaged, and they had no choice but to miss an appointment. Or they turned up at an appointment, and they were kept waiting for two hours. So I think that was just, for Sunak to keep pushing that, I think it was a bit, uh, he made the point is fundamentally unfair on other patients and on, on the system. But I, that's a good example of a politician not really listening. I mean... Doctors themselves, practices were saying this won't, this isn't really workable. Then there's a whole new mechanism where we have to find people, and it just wasn't workable. So please, that's been dropped. But every new prime minister has their own little pet project that they want to push through, and often it's not feasible. Um, but as for the big picture, one good thing about this current period is Brexit is no longer the toxic issue that it was. But one thing I think Sunak's having to deal with is the ghost of Boris Johnson. And so did Liz Truss. Um, and one of the biggest things I think of actually the Johnson Truss and Sunak administrations is sleaze. This is one of the biggest things that the Tories have to really face. And I think if Sunak wants to win the next general election, it would be a very savvy move to present himself as an anti sleaze crusader. I mean, Boris Johnson was far too complacent. In fact, he himself, I believe, was quite corrupt. I think it's a disgrace, you know, um, his supporters, both in the public and people like Nadine Doris, they, they love to trivialise Johnson's flaws. But in the end of the day, I think the public have a big problem with double standards, really. And, you know, people could say that Partygate was trivial. They could say it was just an attack job against Boris Johnson. I don't agree with that at all. I think, you know, when the public had to make very real sacrifices, not attend the family's funerals, for example, for Boris Johnson to throw a party then die about it, that is pure corruption. Now, uh, with Sunak, we've just had uh, Nadim Sahawi and his tax affairs. Uh, there's trust, there was one thing after another. The Tories 
really, really have a problem of corruption and slaves. And I think Sunak would be savvy to take a zero tolerance approach to this. I'm not talking about witch hunts, but he has to really present himself as someone who will not tolerate this sort of uh, culture. Um, indeed, he himself was caught, you know, making that video recently whilst driving. Now, common sense dictates that you can't talk into a camera while you're trying to drive. Maybe he was stationary. I, I don't know the precise circumstances of that. Um, but he has to be aware that the public really have a very low threshold for the idea of one role for them and another role for us. And I think the Tories haven't done anywhere near enough. Neither Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak have really grasped this. Um, Boris Johnson certainly didn't. And I think those sort of things Labour will capitalise on. That's why Labour needs to be white and white at the moment, because if they were caught doing it, you know, that would be hypocrisy. But it's one thing that could bring down this government. Um, I think it played a part in bringing down the major administration back in the 90s. I'm going to wrap this up, 21 minutes now. Um, what's Sunak done well so far? Um, it, it's hard to say. It depends how he handles the strike issue. It depends how he handles sleaze. Um Clearly, the is doing better in the polls, but I don't think that's necessarily Rishi Sunak. I think it's just a general fatigue with the Tories and a perception that they're not in touch. I don't entirely trust Labour when it comes to issues like crime. So, um, you know, I, I was watching a little bit of PMQs the other day and Sunak, you know, resonated a little bit when he said that um, Labour is funded by the unions and just stop oil. Now, Labour has to be very careful about that. Because if they're perceived to be soft on the likes of Just Stop Oil, which the public frankly despise at the moment, um, you know, that's something the Tories could capitalise on. They could present Labour as a party of protesters, which I don't think it is actually, but they could present them that way. So what Rishi Sunak has to do is um, be an adult, not be Boris Johnson, because he isn't, um, but be assertive enough to really, really tackle this issue of sleaze um handle the strike issue well that is to say of course you can't have a situation where there's wildcat strikes and everyone's just jumping on a bandwagon but i think the tories have to show that they're not you know if they start engaging and vilifying nurses in, in that way and or not vilifying but even lecturing nurses as one tory recently did um with that food bank statement it's you know the public will say well you're on eighty four thousand, and you know ministers even more and nurses are on 34,000 and less. So they should be really careful not to come across as condescending and out of touch. Um, I think foreign policy, uh, I'm happy with Sunak. But this is one area, I don't think there's a massive gulf between Sunak and Starmer. And that's good. Because I think both men have quite a sensible foreign policy. They're both staunchly supporting of Ukraine. That's essential. We cannot waver in that. Why? Because it's not just about Ukraine. If Ukraine falls, Russia won't stop. I think Putin is um, the greatest threat to Europe since Hitler. I genuinely believe that. I think he is um, a dangerous tyrant, and I think we need to stand up to him. And I've nothing but contempt for Putin cheerleaders. Um, so Sunak is right to take a hard line on that. Uh, another thing that I'm, I'm happy about is there were some people who felt that Sunak was soft on China. Well, actually, he's been quite assertive in that regard. He has spoken about the need to tackle Confucius Institutes, for example. But the problem in this country and the problem in our system is the government and the prime minister can only do so much. Take universities, for example. They, I think, are being profoundly naive. And it's, it's actually worse than naivety. They're knowingly collaborating with Chinese institutions that have, for example, military links, and they can no longer plead innocence. I think uh, the government should get tough on this. I think they should threaten to withdraw funding from those universities unless they get their act together. It's not good enough to say, oh, we're, we're going through all the security measures when they're clearly um, going out of their way to kowtow to China to get Chinese money. I mean, I, I do think there should be more pressure on those universities to basically stop being um, poodles for Beijing, to put it bluntly. I think they're far, far too um, keen to get Chinese money, and I have a big problem with that. So I think the government should take a hard line on that. But 
certainly the Sino-British golden era is over. That was one of the biggest mistakes of the Cameron Osborne era. And I think that um, Prime Ministers May, Truss and Sunak have been assertive on this. Boris flip-flopped a bit on China. I didn't entirely trust Boris Johnson on China. He flip-flopped. Tough one day, soft the next. Sunak is taking an assertive response. So when it comes to foreign policy, I'm I'm quite happy with Sunak. And I think uh, he seems to get on well with Macron, which is good. Um, too early to say his relations with Biden. Um, Biden couldn't pronounce his name correctly. Uh, whenever Biden next visits this country, if he does, uh, we'll see. But foreign policy, I'm relatively happy with Sunak. Um, yeah, but time will tell. Uh, the, these two big domestic issues, it's public strikes and it's sleaze. Sunak needs to get that right, otherwise the Tories are going to lose the next election. Um, but yeah, um, let me know your thoughts on Rishi Sunak. Uh, if I were to give him a scorecard out of 10... Um, I couldn't give him very high because the sleaze is unacceptable and it just goes on and on. Some of this may be left over from the Boris Johnson era, but really the Tories collectively need to get their act together on this. Um, and Sunak himself, like I say, with that um, motoring violation, you know, he, he said he paid the fine, but that isn't the point. The point is, you know, this idea that the Tories feel entitled, that they can just do it and get away with it. Uh, it's not good enough. Um, so, if I'm ranking Sunak out of 10, a strong 5. A strong 5. I'm not going to be more generous, because time will tell. Uh, foreign policy, I give him 7. I think he's done quite well on foreign policy. Too early to say. There's been no major crisis so far, but um, the Northern Ireland backstop is still an issue. But I would say that he's capable. I think he's smart. Um and, you know, I, I think that time will tell. But that's why I would give Sunak out of 10 so far. I think he's better than Truss. That's saying something. I, I think he is better than Truss. Or rather, that's not saying a lot because Truss was so awful. But um, a strong five. A strong five so far. Pushing a six. You know, I always like to play the devil's advocate a bit. I always give new prime ministers a benefit of the doubt, give them time, give them time. But the way the Tories are now, um, Sunak's going to be under extra pressure because his predecessors were so flawed. So he really, really needs to do a lot to prove to the public that the Tories deserve another term. Okay, let me know your thoughts.